Today, we're gonna to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the like button's hairspray with Gorilla Glue adhesive spray. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On February 24th, 2019, a woman arrived at a ceramics factory in Hubei province in China. She walked through the front door into the main office where she saw a desk attendant. She informed them she was a quality control inspector and she was there that day to inspect their vehicles. The attendant was accustomed to their company being periodically inspected. And so she asked the woman if she needed any help. And the woman said, nope, I'm just gonna roam around your building, check what I need to check, and then I'll be out of here. And so the attendant told her that was totally fine. And if she needed anything, just come back and she would help her. And so the inspector thanked her and then turned around and went out the front door and checked the vehicles in the the front lot of the ceramics factory. And then after she was done, she went back into the main office. She walked past the attendant and out the back door into the very active yard where all day long, these huge bulldozers would move around thousands of pounds of sand. And so the inspector walked out that back door and she scanned the yard and she saw there were two bulldozers doing just that, moving all around. And then off to the left side, there was a dump truck that seemed to be stationary. And so very confidently, she just walked right into the yard and made her way over to that dump truck. And then when she got there, she flagged the driver down and said she was an inspector and that she was gonna check the vehicle out. And so the driver helped her by turning on and off signals and moving back and forth. And then at some point, the inspector needed the dump truck driver to back up a significant distance. She needed to watch him do that. And so she, the inspector, backed away from the dump truck until she was in the middle of the yard, standing right in front of this parked bulldozer. What happens next is all caught on video. And so as she's standing there and she's watching the dump truck back up right in front of her, the bulldozer driver right behind her turns on the machine and immediately lurches forward. Now, the driver of this bulldozer did not see the woman, and she was in his blind spot right in front of the bucket of his bulldozer, and he was not aware there was somebody on foot walking around the yard. It's an extremely dangerous place to be on foot. And so he goes right into her and he knocks her backwards. She falls into the bucket. She starts screaming, but no one can hear her. It's so loud. And the driver drives the bucket directly into a pile of sand and scoops up thousands of pounds of sand that come down directly on this woman. So now she's completely buried alive and being crushed by all the sand. And then the driver, completely oblivious, lifts the bucket up turns around and drives across the yard and dumps the sand and the woman into a vibrating sand crusher. The vibrating sand crusher is exactly what it sounds like. It pulverizes bits of rock and stone and grinds them down into a very fine powder. The machines come in various shapes and sizes, but this one inside of this ceramics factory was a top-loaded version, and it basically looked like a big dumpster with this big opening at the top. And so these bulldozer drivers would take these clumps of sand and they would dump it in this opening at the top of this bin. And then once they dumped their sand into the opening, the machine would vibrate, causing the sand to filter its way down towards the bottom of the machine where there were these big vicious metal claws that constantly smashed together and would just completely obliterate anything that passed through them. In the video, when the driver dumps his bucket load into the sand crusher, you can actually see the woman falling in, but then she immediately jumps into action and begins trying to pull herself up and out of this pile. And at some point she gets most of her upper body out and she waves and she gets the attention of the driver who's just dumped her into the sand crusher and the driver he stops right away you can see the vehicle lurch to a stop he leaps out and he starts running over to the sand crusher but as he's running over this woman who's waving and waving at some point her leg or some other part of her gets grabbed by those jaws at the bottom of the machine and she's pulled slowly down into the sand crusher and disappears under the sand when this happens the driver is frantic and he's screaming for other people in the factory to come over and help and at some point, the others inside, they realize there's an emergency and they all run over. But when they realize what's happened, that someone has fallen into the sand crusher, they all just stop and stand there because they know there's nothing they can do. The woman was gone. In June of 2015, 45-year-old James Young landed his dream job. 
For the last several years, James had been a fifth grade teacher in East Canton, Ohio, teaching special education. And while he loved his job and he loved the kids he worked with, he had always had his eye on becoming a guidance counselor for high school students. In 1988, James had actually graduated from East Canton, Ohio High School. And ever since his graduation, he had wanted to come back to the school and help the next generation of East Canton students prepare for their lives as adults. And a guidance counselor was designed to do just that. James had applied for the job before, but every time he applied, they would tell him that while he was qualified, there just wasn't a spot open for him. However, at the end of that school year, he was told a guidance counselor spot had opened up at the high school and the job was his if he wanted it. And so of course, James said, yes, I'll take the job. And immediately he told his mother about this amazing news. And his mother, who lived only a block away from him in East Canton, Ohio, would say that her son was so ecstatic about the job that normally when summer break was coming up, he would really look forward to that time off from school, but now that he had this new job to look forward to, he was already anxious for the summer to be over. James was a single man, but he was not lonely. He had a number of very close, lifelong friends that he would spend virtually all of his off time with. And that summer, he did just that. He went out with his friends, they explored all of Ohio and outside surrounding areas, they spent a lot of time outside, and they enjoyed each other's company. Towards the end of the summer, James and his friends knew it was time to schedule their annual trip to Cedar Point. Cedar Point is an amusement park about two hours northwest of East Canton, Ohio. It's situated right on the shores of Lake Erie, and it's known for its incredible roller coasters, of which they had 17, making them the park with the second most roller coasters in the world. Every summer, since James could remember, he and his very close friends would make a trip out to Cedar Point, usually at the end of the summer, to kind of cap off their vacation. After looking at their calendar, they decided that the best day to go would be Thursday, August 13th. This would give the group of friends one more fun thing to do before for the following week, James started his new job. So on the morning of that Thursday, the friends piled into a car and they made the two hour commute up to Cedar Point. And as soon as they got there, they went inside, they grabbed a map and they began systematically hitting as many rides as they possibly could. And so by 4.30 PM, they were totally exhausted. They'd been on virtually every ride. And so they were about to call it a day when James and his friends decide, hey, let's go on one more ride before we pack it in. And so they pull out their map and they're looking and they realize they haven't gone on one of their favorite rides. It was called the Raptor. The Raptor was not Cedar Point's biggest roller coaster, but it was their fastest. It would reach a top speed of 57 miles per hour. Passengers are seated four across with their feet dangling below them in these suspended chairs with the big harness that comes down. And then once the ride starts, they're brought slowly up this 137 foot hill. And then at the top, they pause before being dropped down into this nearly 4,000 foot long track that spins them upside down six different times. So James and his friends, they closed up their map and they ran their way over to the Raptor. They got in line and by 4.50 p.m. they had made it to the front of the line. They got into their seats, their harness came down and then the ride started and they were pulled up to the top of the hill. They paused and then they were launched down the track and for two minutes they zipped and zagged and loop-de-looped -looped all through this track and then it was just suddenly over and the friends had a great time on the ride. Except James realized about halfway through the ride when they were upside down, his phone and wallet had come out of his pockets and he actually saw them fall down towards the ground. And although he didn't see exactly where they landed, he had a pretty good idea of where they were. And so after they got off the ride, the friends were kind of talking about how much fun it was. And James said to them, hey, I lost my cell phone and wallet. Will you guys come with me while I go look for them? And so the friends agreed. They left the Raptor station and they walked down the paved path until they were in front of this fence that said no trespassing. And so James gets up to the fence and he's looking inside of this fenced in area. And he sees right in the middle of this restricted area is his phone and his wallet. And before James's friends could tell him not to do this, he had climbed over the fence and entered into this restricted area. He ran over to his phone and his wallet, he picked it up, and then when he stood back up again, the next wave of Raptor riders came blazing through the area, and the underside, the steel underside of the ride, hit James right in the back of the head. He never saw it coming. It threw him forward, he landed on his face, and immediately the park officials saw this happen, they stopped the ride, but the riders on board the Raptor, they didn't know was going on and so they're stopped on the ride they're looking down and they hear people screaming and they look down and they see there's this man James lying face down on the ground with blood pooling around his head the fence James had climbed over was there specifically to keep visitors from getting too close to this one low point in the raptor
strapped to ride where the ride can come through and it can hit you. And so medical workers, they rush over, they hop over the fence, they get to James, but it was too late. He was pronounced dead at the scene. That day, Cedar Park was put under investigation for James's death, but after reviewing the footage and talking to witnesses, the investigation was closed and they determined that the park was not at fault. James, despite being a very intelligent and sensible man, had a brief lapse in judgment and it unfortunately cost him his life. Today, Cedar Park is still open for business and the Raptor ride is still operational. On August 14th, 2012, Celestino Cervantes picked up 28-year-old Victor Diaz for work. Celestino was an expert roofer and he had just hired Victor to come on his crew and help him with a particular job. This was going to be Victor's first day as a roofer, but for the past 10 years he had worked in construction, so he was familiar with the operation. The two men arrived at their job site in San Antonio, Texas around 8 a.m. that morning. They were in charge of putting a new roof on a 115 year old building that was being redeveloped into a fancy steakhouse. Until 2001, this building had been used by a brewing company to house their enormous boilers. As such, this building was referred to as the boiler house. Protruding from the boiler house roof was this large metal duct that was 15 feet long and almost looked like a covered walkway, and it connected to the side of this huge smokestack. This duct and smokestack used to be how the built-up condensation inside the boiler house was able to travel up and out of the building. When the two roofers got out of their truck, Celestino told Victor to take his tools and make his way up to the roof of the boiler house and get to work and that he had a few things he had to do down on the ground floor, but he would be up to check on him in a little bit. Celestino turned around and was fiddling with his equipment inside of the truck while Victor made his way into the building and out of sight. An hour and a half later, Celestino went up to the roof to check on Victor, but he couldn't find Victor anywhere and he couldn't find his tools anywhere. So Celestino went back down into the main section of this building where other contractors that were working on this renovation were, and he began asking them, hey, have you seen this guy, Victor? He works with me, I can't find him, and no one had seen him. And so Celestino is thinking to himself, well, I guess Victor must have left, but that didn't really make any sense because Victor didn't have a vehicle and he didn't live nearby. But Celestino's thinking, you know what? Maybe somebody came and picked him up. Now, unfortunately, Victor did not carry a cell phone, so nobody had any way of getting directly in contact with him. So Celestino leaves the building and he calls Victor's brother and he asks him, you know, have you seen Victor? Do you know where he might have gone? And Victor's brother says, no, I haven't seen him since this morning when he left with you. So Victor's brother began calling around to friends and family and asked them if they had seen Victor, but nobody knew where he was. So for the rest of the day, Celestino and the rest of Victor's friends and family, they went out looking for Victor at the job site and around the surrounding areas, but there was just no sign of him. And so that night, Victor's brother went to the police to file a missing person report. But the police told him that it was really too early to file a report because Victor was an adult and there was no sign of foul play and that he should just come back in a day or two if Victor still has not shown up. Two days go by and Victor had still not shown up. So Victor's sister-in-law went back to the police and says, okay, now I wanna file a missing person report. We don't know where he is. No one can get in touch with him. We need your help. But the officer she spoke to told her that she still needed to wait another five days to process this request. It would turn out this was just not true. It was a mistake. There was no arbitrary waiting period to file a missing person report. So without any help from the police, Victor's friends and family and coworkers spent the next several days scouring San Antonio, scouring the job site, looking everywhere for him and handing out flyers and asking people if they'd seen him, but no one had, he had just disappeared. By Monday the following week, so six days after after Victor has gone missing, his family had printed out dozens of these huge posters with his face on them and a number to call if you had any information about him. And their plan was to distribute them the following morning all over San Antonio. But the following morning, before they headed out, they got a call. Victor had been found. Seven days earlier, when Celestino told Victor to head inside and make his way to the roof and begin the project, Victor had gotten his tools, gone inside, he made his way up the stairwell to the second floor, and then he made a series of odd decisions. Instead of making his way to the access door and climbing his way up to the roof, he went to the far side of the second floor where there were all these wooden barriers preventing people from going any farther. He climbed over all these barriers and he reached the entrance to that huge duct where the condensation used to go. 
And so from his perspective, he would have been looking into this duct and it would have been completely pitch black because it connected to that smokestack and the smokestack was totally sealed off. But despite not having any idea where this tunnel goes and it clearly not being the place Celestino told him to go, Victor decides to just get into this tunnel, which required bending over because it was only four feet tall and five feet wide. So he gets inside of this tunnel and he begins shuffling his way deeper and deeper into this tunnel until he reaches the end of the tunnel where it actually connects into the smokestack. Now at the top of this duct where it connects to the smokestack, there wasn't a grate or bars or any sort of barrier that would stop you from spilling into the smokestack. And because it was totally pitch black, Victor, when he made it to the edge of that duct, he just kept on walking and fell 20 feet down to the bottom of the smokestack. And so in total darkness, Victor, who was probably badly hurt from the fall, began feeling around the inside of the chimney looking for a way out. And he eventually found a hatch that was big enough for him to fit through. But when he felt up against it, he realized it was locked from the outside and it wouldn't even budge. He couldn't even get light to come in through a crack. It was totally sealed off. And that was the only way out of the smokestack unless he could get back up to the duct. But there was no way to do that. He most likely began screaming for help, but he was encased in thick brick, and so his sound wouldn't have traveled. It would have been completely muffled. Plus, the smokestack was fairly far away from the job site, which was very noisy as it is, and so there was just no way they could have heard him, and the smokestack and the duct were not part of the renovation, and so there was absolutely no foot traffic over around the smokestack. He was completely alone, no one knew he was there, and there was no way out. Seven days after Victor fell into the smokestack, workers over at the job site, they noticed this huge swarm of flies over around the base of the smokestack. There were so many flies over there, they decided they had to go investigate. And so as they walked closer and closer to the smokestack, they were hit with this overwhelming stench of death and decay. And then when they got to the smokestack, they could see the flies were centralized on that hatch at the bottom. And so they cut the lock, they opened it up, and inside they found Victor's body and they saw his hands were badly bloodied and bruised, and they were pressed up against the inside of the hatch, indicating in his final moments, he was desperately trying to open that hatch and save himself, but there was just no way to do that. Although no one knows this for sure, it's believed Victor confused the condensation duct with the access point to the roof. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us a timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please replace the like buttons hairspray with Gorilla Glue adhesive spray. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination. Just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.